Glad you're here today, and we'll welcome any others that come on in uh, in just a few minutes. We're going through the, the Gospel of John, hitting the highlights of some things that I think are particularly meaningful to you and to me, and um, we're, we're missing a lot of things, but that's okay because we're getting some very good things that we need. Um, in John chapter 5, there's the story of this, this man that was a sick man that was lying under the porticos at this pool, the pool of Bethsaida in Jerusalem. Uh, this pool is, uh, in its original form, was pretty much what you see uh, here in this picture. This is reconstructed from the archaeological uh, dig that's there. This is the actual dig in uh, Jerusalem. It's near the Sheep Gate, and uh, it's, it's very deep. And at the very bottom of this dig, you can see the original stones of the pool. And archaeologists that reconstruct this, and this is what they come up with is how the pool looked in the beginning. It had uh, porticos running down each of the four sides of the rectangle and one that ran through the middle. And these covered porticos were shaded areas in which sick people lay. And uh, they believed in the therapeutic value of this pool. So many times we're looking for the healing that we need in our lives in the wrong places. And this pool was one of the wrong places that people were looking for healing. The, the answer to their problem, the answer to their difficulty was not in the pool. The answer was Jesus. So in uh, John chapter 5 and verse 6, Jesus asked this man a question. He said, do you want to get well? And of course, that almost seems like an insensitive question because the guy had been sick and the guy had been laying there uh, and trying to uh, find some kind of therapeutic value for like 38 years. Obviously, the man wanted to get well. But uh, Jesus asked him that question. Now, sometimes, you know, when we think of our own health uh, and we ask, do you want to get well? There are many people that desperately want to get well, but sometimes we need to take responsibility uh, for our own health care if we want to get well. Uh, this guy was trying to do that the best he knew, but it wasn't working. It reminds me of the lady in another gospel that had been to all the physicians and spent all her money on physicians and still she had this issue of blood, and she wasn't finding what she needed there. Um, there is a great physician, and he's the one that can heal our souls, and that's the point. As we go through this passage, you know, the sick guy, we have compassion on him. We can't imagine, you know, fighting with an illness that long. Maybe some of you can. But we talked last time about this word well or hold or sound. What does it mean to be well? You know, nobody's completely well. You realize that, right? We've all got stuff wrong with us. We've all got stuff spiritually wrong with us. We've all got stuff physically wrong with us. But if, if we're going to have, you know, we sing this song, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, you know, whatever my lot, you know, I can still say it is well, it is well with my soul. Is your soul well? This is the word in the New Testament that sometimes translated sound, like in Timothy and Titus, sound doctrine. That's this word. It means healthy. It means well. It means the kind of teaching that will make a healthy, whole, sound Christian. See, that's the idea of sound, healthy doctrine. It, it's the same... Um, uh, type of thing when a uh, person's examining a horse and they're seeing if they want to buy the horse and they're feeling the horse's legs and, and looking in his mouth and everything and they say, this animal is sound. This is a healthy animal. That's the idea, healthy. So Jesus says to this guy, do you really want to be healthy? Do you want to get well? And Jesus tells the man to get up, take up his bed and walk. And the text here in verse 9 says, the man became well. He found a physical wholeness that he hasn't, hadn't had in years. Now, I've realized over the past several will, uh, years that I will never be well in the sense that I used to be. I realized that that ship has sailed 
See, I will never be whole in the way I used to be. The vigor, the the strength will never be the same as it was, but I'm grateful for the degree of wellness that I have that enables me to be standing here. Uh, this guy, you know, was cured. He was healed. He was made well on the Sabbath. And in verse 11, uh, the man talks about Jesus. He who made me well. If you go down through that text, it's repeated over and over and over again. Jesus made me well. Uh, again, it calls the man he who was healed. And a little bit later, Jesus finds him and says, Behold, you have been made well. And then he says, Do not sin any more that nothing worse may befall you. So there's a worse sickness than whatever ails me and you and whoever's next to you. You've all got your aches and pains. And I've got mine. But there's a worse sickness than that. It's a soul Six, uh, sickness. There's an old song that we used to sing. There is a balm in Gilead that heals the sin sick soul. Um, a balm is a medicine. It's a it's a salve. It's it's uh, something that can heal. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter eight and verse twenty two, Jeremiah was preaching to Israel, and Israel was sick. And Israel was in bad shape spiritually. And he compared Israel to a person that was so sick or so wounded and so far gone that there wasn't much hope for him. See? And here's what he says. He says in Jeremiah 8, verse 22, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? What Jeremiah concludes, if you keep reading Jeremiah, is in that case for Israel, there was no help. Too late, no help. But there is a balm in Gilead, and its name is Jesus. See, Jesus is the medicine. Jesus is the salve that soothes and heals the sin-sick soul. He alone is the great physician. And when you lay your head down at night... And when you try to go to sleep, if peace like a river is going to attend your way at that moment, it's going to be because you've been touched by the great physician. If Jesus is yours and you are his and he has healed your soul, then you will be well in the eyes of God. You know, we've talked about this before. Um, I was talking to some of the students in Denver. They're just like all the rest of us in this way, but but they have chapel and they have prayer requests. And it's good and right, don't misunderstand me, it's good and right that we should pray for each other physically because the Bible teaches that. But most of the prayers in the New Testament are spiritual prayers. Did you realize that? Jesus, in John 17, he's got one last chance to stand before his disciples and pray with them. What does he pray for? Three things. Keep them in your name, Lord. Keep them from the evil one, Lord. Sanctify them in the truth. Notice he didn't pray for Peter's bunions or John's upset stomach or for Thomas's busted thumb. or He didn't pray for any of those things. He prayed spiritual prayers. Paul prays prayers for people. Listen to Paul's prayer and see what, what bunions or diseases he's praying for. He says, I, for this cause I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Now listen that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, that you should be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be strong to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
You see what Paul was praying for? He was praying for the sin sick soul that it might be healed. See? He was praying for the touch of the one that asked this man in John chapter 5, do you really want to get well? See? And when he told the man to go and sin no more so that a worse fate might befall him, he, he meant to tell the man there's a lot worse thing than being lame. There's a lot worse thing than having cancer. There's a lot worse thing than having heart disease. There's, there's a lot worse thing than getting older. But there's a healer. And his name is Jesus. See? And in John 1.14, when he said, The word became flesh and lived among us, and we saw his glory. One of the things they saw when they saw his glory was that it's only Jesus that can make you well. So you can sing, it is well with my soul. Turn your Bibles to John 6. John 6. We see pictures like this and Jason... Inlo was talking earlier about people in Honduras. I'll never forget the first time I was in Mexico City about 1982 or three or something like that. And I saw piles upon piles, mountain upon mountain of cardboard homes and millions of people living in squalor, you know. Um, I got a glimpse because Johnny showed me uh, a glimpse, just a glimpse of some of the favelas in, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. I remember in Panama, uh, not Panama Beach, Florida, but Panama, Central America, uh, looking at, uh, at between, you know, the, the trash and all the stuff of, of the families that lived in squalor there. And uh, there are hungry people. We see pictures of Children like this that are hungry. I've never been hungry in my life. And, uh, but Jesus said in John 6, I'm the bread of life. He who keeps coming to me will never hunger. He who keeps trusting me will never thirst. In John 6, the first several verses, you have the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And interestingly enough, this story is one of the only stories that's in all four Gospels. It's very unique in that way. And, uh, you know, Jesus has this big multitude that's following him out into the desert. And he sees this great big bunch of people. There were 5,000 men. And he says uh, to, to Philip, you know, um, what are we going to feed all these people? And Philip looks at this. How would you feel if 5,000 people came to dinner? You know, what are we going to feed all these people? And uh, he was testing Philip, and uh, Philip, you know, looked in his purse, which was, you know, the Judas handed, had, handled the purse, and the purse that they had for the disciples had 200 denarii. And they could go into the city, and they could buy loaves with 200 denarii, and a, a denarius was one day's wages. So you had 200 days of wages, and for a family, that's quite a bit, but for 5,000 people, you know, I, a couple of y'all have boys that could eat that much food, you know. There's some whoppers of boys around here, you know. But uh, can you imagine 5,000 people? And so, you know, Philip says, look, Lord, we've only got 200 denarii, and these people couldn't have a little communion pinch for that much, you know. It wouldn't work. And so one of them found this kid that had a sack lunch, probably a basket lunch, and he says he's got five barley loaves. Now, that's cheap bread. It's not good soft wheat bread. I mean, white bread. It's cheap bread made out of barley. And I got two little fish. The word for fish is a diminutive term. It means little bitty fish, like sardines or something, you know. I got five barley loaves and two little fish. But what is that to feed so many? What's the problem, Jesus? There's 5,000 people. They're hungry. How are we going to feed 5,000 people? See, Jesus was interested in feeding them in a different way than they thought. But 
he says, okay, have them all sit down. And so they sat down and Jesus took the loaves. Look at verse 11 there on the screen. He took the loaves and having given thanks, he distributed to those that were seated. Now, this is a tiny little parenthesis here. I can't help myself. If you want to study something out, Brandon, you take, you take the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, and the Lord's Supper institution in the Gospels, okay? You look up every passage where you have the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, and the institution of the Lord's Supper. And you'll find in every one of those passages that Jesus took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, okay? Now, when he, when he took the bread in the feeding of the 5,000 and broke it, why was he breaking it? So he could pass it out. It was big hunks, and he broke it off and handed that one a chunk and that one a chunk. What was the religious significance of breaking it? Nada. None. See? And um, so... The breaking of the bread in the Lord's Supper has no significance whatever. It's the taking of the unleavened bread itself. The breaking is not significant, okay? Christ did not have a broken body. Uh, the Bible says his bones were not broken in John chapter 19, okay? So it's the eating of the bread, the drinking of the cup, and the thanking God for it all that's the significant part in the rite. That's a rabbit. <laughs> Boom, now the rabbit is dead, you know, he's dead. But check that out in your, in your Bible. Also check out that bless and give thanks are used interchangeably. Bless is not one thing and give thanks another thing. The word bless means to give praise. Blessed be thou, Lord our God, King of the earth, who brings forth bread from the earth. Praise be to you, Lord our God. That was the prayer for the bread in Judaism. You're not doing anything to the bread. You're not putting a divine whammy on the bread. That's not what the, the prayer means. The Lord's Supper prayer is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what the Lord's Supper prayer is supposed to be about. That's why ancient Christians called it Eucharist, because Eucharisteo means to give thanks. See, give thanks for he is good. His loving kindness endures forever. So... That rabbit is dead. Now, at the end of this uh, account, when Jesus feeds all these people and they get 12 baskets of leftovers, look at verse 14. The people saw the sign which he had performed, and they said, this is truly the prophet. The prophet is the prophet like Moses from Deuteronomy 18, 15. Why did they think Jesus was like Moses? Because Moses had... Many more than 5,000. He had 603,550 men plus women and children out in the desert. And he fed them with manna from heaven. See, God gave them manna from heaven. So Moses took them out in the desert and gave them bread from heaven. Now Jesus takes them out into the desert and gives them bread from heaven. And they say, you've got to be the prophet like Moses from Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. Because you did the same thing Moses did. But they they were right about that, but they kind of missed the point. So what happened, and I'm skipping some stuff, is that night came, Jesus uh, was up there in, in a hill somewhere, and the disciples got in the boat and went across the sea, and Jesus was not with them, see? And that night, Jesus walked out on the sea and met his disciples in the middle of the sea, but most of the people didn't see that. And so the people crossed to the other side, and they couldn't figure out where Jesus had gone. And uh, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, I like food. You like food. I got to eat some enchiladas in Denver, and I liked them really good. See, I've got to stay away from them right now, but they, they were really good. And sometimes I really uh, just like, ah, that is so good, that food. I could eat me a gallon of ice cream, and I would just love it, you know. But food is good. But the tragedy here was that Jesus said, you ate of the loaves and were satisfied. That temporary satisfaction that a good meal gives us, 
or that temporary satisfaction that something else good in life gives us, a good drink of water, a good meal, a good rest, that temporary satisfaction that we give is kind of a delusion. Because, see, if the devil can keep us satisfied with those things, we'll forget the biggest hole we've got in us. And that's the hole in our soul. That's the hunger of our spirit. That's the hunger of our inner being for something that's going to fill us up, that's going to give us ultimate meaning and fulfillment in ourselves. And Jesus is the only one that can provide that. So look at what Jesus says in verse 27. This is really important to the message of this chapter. Because, see, the sign of the feeding of the 5,000 has a spiritual meaning. And the spiritual meaning of that sign is that only Jesus is the bread of life. It's not those hot rolls that he made or whatever it was he made. It's Jesus himself that is the bread of life. So Jesus says to these people, do not work for the food which perishes. See, if you, if you saw the terrain around Galilee, they had come down out of those hills. They'd gotten on boats. They'd gone miles and miles across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. They had really put in a lot of effort to find Jesus again and to get some more bread out of him. See, he, he, they wanted him to make some more bread. So he says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures unto eternal life. Here's the nut that I want you to get. All of you out there work or have worked for your food. You work, you make a living to buy food and put food on the table, right? Think of the years and the hours and the blood, sweat and tears you've put into working for your food, right? But how much work, how much effort do we put out individually to seek and eat the bread of life? See? We're always, what are we going to eat today? What are we going to eat tonight? What are we going to eat after, you know, what are we going to, but what about the bread of life? See? Look at the, look at what he says again. Do not work for the food which perishes, but... You've got to put a word in between the but and the for there. What is the word you have to supply? But work for the food which endures unto eternal life. See, we've got to seek that. We've got to put some effort into that. And so they thought he was going to give them some more bread. So they said, okay, what what should we do to work the works of God? In other words, we'll do it and then you feed us again. Right, Jesus? And he said, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And see, they misunderstood. They thought he was saying, you work and I'll give you some more bread. But he says, if you'll really trust me, if you'll really get close to Jesus, if you'll work at your relationship with me, you'll receive the food that'll feed your soul. See, that's how you eat the bread of life. And so they said, What then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe? In other words, prime in the pump, give us more of that bread. Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. What do they want Jesus to do? Give us some more bread. See, like you gave us last time. Jesus, therefore, said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but my father gives you the true bread out of heaven. Notice the contrast. The bread out of heaven, the manna. But what's the true bread? Remember in chapter 1, he talked about light and the true light. And in chapter 15, he talks about vines and the true vine. See? So what's the true bread? He says, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Who came down out of heaven? Well, Jesus did. See? And he explains... In verse 35, they say, oh, Lord, give us this bread. They meant feed us some more loaves. But Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, an important thing about those words in that verse. The word comes to me is a present Active indicative verb, which means this. It's a continuous action. It's not a one-time thing. What he means is, he who keeps on coming to me. 
and he who keeps on trusting in me. Now, how do we keep on coming to Jesus? Um, The best way I can describe this is a little child who's playing, and his mother is there somewhere, and periodically the little child will break off from playing and go up and tug on his mother's leg or just give his mother a hug, and then he'll go off, and then he'll come back and tug on her again and hug, and he'll keep coming back to the mother over and over and over again. I don't know how many hugs I got from my mother during my life, but it was a bunch of them, see? I just kept on coming back, and I knew I'd get another hug every time I came back, see? But we don't come to Jesus once. See, that's a misconception. We do not come to Jesus once. Yes, we initially decide to form a relationship with Jesus, but we don't just come to Jesus once. Now, this next part, please listen to what I'm saying. I realize, full well I realize, that this passage is about something bigger, and this passage itself is not about specifically the Lord's Supper. I understand that. I get that. But I also realize that people who do what this verse says, and they're continually coming to Jesus, those are the same people that are continually coming to the foot of the cross every week in the Lord's Supper, and they're recommitting to that relationship with Jesus. They're reconnecting to that relationship with Jesus. And that's not the only time they're doing it. They're doing it every time they pray. They're doing it every time they seek him in his word. Uh, they're, they're continually touching base with Jesus because they know they need Jesus. That continual coming, that continual trusting, however it's expressed, is how you eat the bread of life. Now, go down a couple of verses. Um, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted. Nope, that's not what I wanted. That's back in chapter 5, disregard. Do not think about any of those verses right now. I've got some stuff in there I didn't mean to have. Okay, that was not the exact file. Okay, that's okay. So go down to verse 40, I think it is. Chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 6, verse 40. And this is very similar to verse 35. He says, This is the will of my Father that everyone who beholds the Son and everyone who believes on the Son has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Now, in verse 35, you have comes to me and believes on me. In verse 40, you have beholds the Son and believes on the Son. All right, the word beholds is also one of those present participles, and it means keep on looking. So how often do you look at Jesus? You keep looking at him. You keep looking. And when you realize you've looked away for a while, you intentionally keep looking at him. You keep looking toward him. See, you keep coming to him. You keep trusting in him. That is intentional. This is what I want you to see. You don't do that accidentally. This is something you decide to do. And we must decide to fill our lives with Jesus. We must decide to eat the bread of life. Once we realize that he is the bread of life, we personally decide to continually keep coming to him and continually to keep trusting in him and to continually keep looking toward him in our life. We decide that. Okay? Now, how are you doing that in your life? See, wrap your arms around this truth that Jesus is the spiritual bread that feeds my soul. So I want to eat more. Now, see, I eat regularly. You do too. I want to eat more. I want to keep coming to the table. And I'm not just talking about the Lord's table. I I want to keep taking Jesus into my life. 
So, one of the ways I do that is I continually try to meditate on his word and think about Jesus and what he wants me to do and get close to him. Um, I hang out with Jesus. See? He who keeps on coming to me. Well, we sing an old song that all of y'all like. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Why do I come there? Well, because there he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. See? So that's why I go there. But I have to choose to go there. Right? We can't just go off doing our thing in the world madly and crazily and and expect Jesus to catch up with us. We've got to go there and meet him, see? We've got to be the ones that continually come to him. We do that in prayer when we really seek the Lord in prayer. Um, And again, I understand that the passage is not about the Lord's Supper and it's not about Sunday church or any of that. But one of the times for me, this is just me, one of the times when I really, in, in the week, really make a serious seeking of my Lord is at the Lord's Supper. I come to him in my mind. I talk to him in my mind. I pray to him. I thank him. I tell him, Lord, I'm grateful for this relationship. And Lord, I want to keep this relationship. And I'm still in this thing. And I want to walk with you. And, and that's not the only time I do that. But I'm coming to him. See? And when I read passages like this, when I study about Jesus and I, and I think about Jesus and I meditate on where my relationship is and my, my family's relationship is and everything, I, I come to him again in that. And when I talk with you or somebody else about Jesus and about what he means to me and how he's important in my life and how I want him to be in your life, then I'm coming to him again. I'm trusting in him, trying to in my life. And I decide to keep trusting in him. Now, do I ever get discouraged about it? Yeah. Are there ever people, even in the church, that hurt me and discourage me about it? Yes. But I decide I'm going to keep trusting him. I'm going to keep coming to him. I'm going to keep pursuing Jesus in my life. Folks, that's how you eat the bread of life. That's how you eat the bread of life. In in the passage, as you keep reading, if you look down at chapter 6, verse 41, I don't have it on on the screen, so you can just black that out if you want to, the screen. But in 641... The Jews therefore complained about him and, and uh, because he said, I am the bread which came down out of heaven. See? And uh, drop down to verse 51. Uh, verse 48, actually. He says, I am the living bread. Your fathers ate the manna in the desert and died. But... Um, This is the bread that comes down out of heaven, that whoever eats of it might never die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. And some of those literalistic Jews were like grossed out and they said, how's he going to give us his flesh to eat? How's he going to do that? Because it was sort of like Nicodemus back in chapter 3. How am I going to be born again? Am I going to enter into my mother's womb and be born again? Sort of like the woman at the well that said, you haven't even got a bucket. How are you going to get the bucket down in the well? And where am I going to get this living water? They, they weren't thinking spiritually. They weren't thinking about their relationship with God. They weren't grasping what Jesus was trying to tell them. And so he grossed them out some more, if you keep reading down a little bit further. And he said, whoever... Uh, eats my flesh and drinks my blood. See? And Jesus used a different word. Usually the word eat is is one word that's most of this passage, but when he gets down to this, he uses the word trogon, which means to chew on it. 
Now, that really got their goat when he said that. He literally said, whoever chews on my flesh and drinks... Can you see how people would be put off by that saying? That's what he says. But, but let me suggest this. Christ and the word of Christ and your relationship with Christ is something you need to chew on. It's something that you need to not just waller and swallow and hurry up with, you know. You need to chew it for a while. You need to think about it for a while. You need to meditate on it. You need to process it. You need to 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 keep it in your mouth for a while. You need to chew it for a while. See, that's kind of the idea here. And so what he's talking about is people who want this relationship and continually keep coming back to Jesus to get a little bit more of Jesus and to touch base with Jesus and to think about and build their relationship with Jesus. And in doing that over time, they're eating the bread of life. See? Does that also involve, as one little part of that, faithfully taking the Lord's Supper? Yes. But let me suggest... That when, you, when you're seeking Jesus in the Lord's Supper, that you chew on that for a little while. You know what I mean? Really think about your relationship with Jesus. Really praise him and thank him and bless him for his kindness and goodness toward you. Really promise him and talk with him about how you want to um, be with him and stay with him in the future, you know. Really commit yourself to him in that time and in other times. But in that way, you're not just eating the cracker and drinking the grape juice. I think a lot of times we eat the cracker and drink the grape juice. That little tiny cracker, man, it's so tiny, it's like, huh? You know, it's like, huh? Huh? Hmm. It, was it there or was it not? I've t- I, I warn you all out with this story, but I, I love my mom. And we were sitting right over there somewhere. And she, she, her hands were like this, you know. So she reaches out for the communion bread back which we ha- when we had the big chunks in the trays, you know. And she goes, yeah. And she goes, Psh. she broke off a major hunk of that stuff. And then she goes, Psh. and she got her little... And she pinched her off a little corner, and she still had a big old hunk of it there. She looked at me like, what am I supposed to do with this? I said, eat it, Ma. And she couldn't imagine actually taking a mouthful of that stuff and just crunching it up. Let me ask you a question. This is to make the point. Do you want a little tidbit bite of Jesus or do you want to really have a chunk of him in your life? I'm being serious. Have you chosen in your life to take a little corner once in a great while of the living bread? Or have you chosen to fill your life with the living bread? See, we, it's, just, it's like drinking the water of life, the Spirit of God. We can be filled with it or we can drink a thimbleful. It's up to you. You choose to come to Jesus. You choose to keep trusting in Jesus. You choose to keep believing on Jesus. Now let's let's do a little review here real quickly. Who is Jesus? How do you see his glory in the Gospel of John? Chapter one, he's the true light which gives light to every man. Chapter 1, he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Chapter 1, he's Jacob's ladder. Chapter 1, verse 51, that connects God to man and man to God. He connects me to God and God to me. He's Jacob's ladder. Chapter 2, he's the best wine that's been saved to last. 
He's the destroyer of the old temple and the builder of the new one. Chapter 2. Chapter 3, he's the bringer of new birth. He, he, he changes us that drastically. Chapter 4, he's the well of living water. Only he can give it. Chapter 5, he's the great physician who makes us well. Thank you, God. Chapter 6, he's the bread of life that feeds our soul. See, the Gospel of John helps us see the many-sided glory of Jesus. And it means everything to those that have that relationship. For those that don't, it's foolishness. I hope this class has been a blessing to you. This is all I've got. I've got some other slides next week. We'll go into chapter 10. But God bless you, and I hope you have a great day.